All right, so we talked about, you know, if I've got some hunk of magnetic material like I have right here, right? I can think of this hunk of magnetic material as being a resistor. That resistance, we don't call it resistance, we call it reluctance, all right? And I, maybe I use this interchangeably, but the real term that we use is sort of a script R uh, for reluctance to differentiate from resistance, but it's the magnetic form of resistance. So what's the magnetic form of voltage? MMF, magnetomotive force, right? So, and, and what cause, what is, what causes that magnetomotive force? A current, all right? So NI, so the way I've written it here, NI, MMF is the magnetomotive force that causes a flux, right? So basically, you know, in summary for magnetic circuits, just like electric circuits, Ohm's law is voltage equals current times resistance. So here I have MMF equals flux times reluctance. KCL is the sum of the fluxes at a node is zero. KVL is the sum of the MMFs around the loop is zero. <laughs> and reluctance is just like resistance in terms of its formula, right? So there you got the formula there for how you would calculate it. <clears throat> All right, so the other day we started talking about some of the non-idealities of these magnetic materials, right? Um, and so the, the basic behavior I started talking about was what's called saturation. All right, so I showed this picture here. Um, so what we say is that if I if I look macroscopically, microscopically at what's happening inside of, of that magnetic material, what you see here inside of it is all these little magnetic domains, which we said magnetic dipoles that exist inside of this thing, right? So basically little fragments within the iron, right, which act like little magnets. And so the picture that's drawn here is to say, okay, if you looked at a section of that real blown up, basically have all these dipoles kind of randomly oriented like I have in this image, right? So the arrows are all going different ways. When you wrap a coil around this thing and put a current in the coil, that makes a B field. So what I call it here, B applied, right? So that B field or flux, if I want to think of it that way, and I, I, sometimes I use B and flux interchangeably because if I have a B field, I have a flux, right? So that B applied, what's going to happen to all of those little magnetic dipoles inside that thing? So they're all randomly oriented, but once I apply the B field to it like that from a coil, what are they all going to do? Yeah, they're all going to line up. So eventually I get to that direction. So what we say is, is that once they all sort of line up, that the material is saturated. So it's kind of like the, the way we think of this is it's like I get a boost effectively from the, the fact that these guys are all kind of arranged in a particular direction. And once they're all aligned, that boost is gone for me. So what, what that led to is basically the way, the way we typically model this, and this is not exactly how it really works. There's a little bit of a difference, but we look at it like this. Um, is that the ideal magnetic material will be what's shown there on the left, right? Where B equals mu H. That's what you learned, right? B equals mu H. And mu, we say, is some... How, how much better is the material than air? So we said mu relative times mu naught is the mu. That's what you learned in fields, right? In reality, what we said is we have this saturation. So if the current that I put into the device gets to be too large, right? Yeah, basically is, is as I keep pumping, and, and this is, here. so like you look at the problem I did, so I don't have it here. But if you look at the notes that I posted from the other day, basically, you know, what we did is, um, I'll jump to here, basically. So I, the example I did the other day, I said, let's say I had a, a material with no gap. So my circuit would look like this. And then over here, I say, what happens if I have a material that has a gap? Same material, but a gap. So there's going to be two reluctances. What we calculated in each of these cases, and I have my, my notes, you know, go through the formulas here, but basically it says that there's a range of currents where I'm in the linear region right here, right? There's a range of currents between what I call, so the, the range is basically set by these set, what I call the saturation current. So in the example I did the other day, this was like 0 0.5 amps. And when it was gapped, it was like 1.6 amps, something like that. So it says that as long as the current that I'm putting in the inductor is between negative 0.5 and 0.5, then the reluctance is, 
is essentially um, the, the inductance is bigger, all right? Because we think in terms of the inductance. So in other words, what this, and that's maybe this is the bottom line of what I'm saying is, is there's a peak B field that can ever exist in the material, right? There's a maximum B field that can ever exist. And so if I try to push the current further and further, which should make the B field bigger, that, maybe, that's, maybe that's the main question to, to what he's asking, right? Is in theory, if I keep pushing more current into the coil, you would expect there to be more B field. What's what is happening is no, it can't do that. The material can't support that. I could keep pushing more current in, but I get no more B field out of it. All right. So once I reach that point, that's when I say that the material is saturated. Yeah. And the example I did the other day, we said sometimes I put an air gap in there. One of the reasons we do an air gap is not just because, well, it'd be cool to put gaps in there. It's not necessarily inherently obvious why you would put gaps in. But why you would do it is it allows you to put more current in if it's gapped than if not. So effectively, it says I can have the same size core, but pushing more current. That's a good thing from a certain perspective because it says I don't need to buy a bigger core to actually do that. A bigger core means a lot in a lot of cases, right? So a bigger core might mean what? If I had to use a core that was three times bigger, let's say, to carry the same current, what would be bad about that from like a product perspective? Yeah, like constraints, on size. constraints on size, which I, no, that means my product can be a hell of a lot more expensive, right? Because I'm going to have to buy a bigger core. It's going to be bigger. So but the box that I have to buy for, it's going to be bigger, all that kind of stuff. Um, one interesting thing nowadays, um, let's say you're talking about electric vehicle, right? Um, you're going to have more weight. That's going to be worse fuel efficiency, all, the, all sorts of things that, that would come into play. And you're going to need a lot of a lot of magnetics in an electric vehicle because it's got power electronics, and that's where we use this stuff. Okay. So anyway, we talked about this effect of saturation. Now today, what I wanted to talk about same sort of non-idealities, but one of the things that we talk about a lot is we call it AC excitation. All right. So if I apply a voltage to a um, inductor, now why would I talk about a 60 hertz voltage in particular? Why a 60 hertz? Why do I specifically focus on 60 hertz? We always do. What's special about 60 hertz? Hopefully somebody knows what's special about 60 hertz. What we need it's what's, yeah, it's what we got on the power system. The whole power grid across the whole U.S. is 60 hertz, across whole North America, right? So as we're going to start dealing with next week, we're going to start talking about transformers, right? So that's going to be the first kind of magnetic device that we really start talking about. We got all these transformers out all over the world. They're all connected to 60 hertz. And so they, we need to figure out how they behave. Why is it 60 hertz? Well, that's a, that's a different sort of, but Historically, it was decided it was going to be 60 hertz, you know, 100 and some odd years ago, and that's what it is. Um, why it's 60 versus, like in the most of the rest of the world, it's 50 hertz. Uh, why we chose 60 versus 50, I don't know. I know why we chose 60 over DC, which was the other option, but uh, I'm not sure why we chose 60 over 50. Um, I, and we we could talk about that. I don't want to get track, lost, lost the track on that. If it were up, up to the people nowadays, we probably would be doing things differently than what we did. The world's a different place than it was. And, 1900 right but um anyway this is this is what we've got 60 hertz all right so if i connect 120 volts 60 hertz up to an inductor all right <clears throat> let's say i want to figure out some things with this inductor so that voltage that i have right there 120 volts that's an rms value right because i'm talking ac so the voltage v of t let's say if i told you i wanted to find the current in that thing, how would you figure out the current? I won't say V of T, you would want to use phasers, wouldn't you? So I'd want to say V, how would I figure out the current in that thing? This is not a magnetic circuit, right? It's an electrical circuit. Well, divided by its impedance, right? So V equals J omega L times whatever I is, right? So if, if I, Divided by that, I'd be able to figure that out. <clears throat> um, now, what else do I know? Um, 
from a magnetic perspective, that 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 omega L I relates to fluxes and stuff like that, right? So we also know we said that V of T, which you guys know is L D I by D T. We've also made this definition that lambda is equal to what? And what the heck is lambda? What's that? What's the name of lambda? Flux linkage, right? That's equal to L I. So I basically have this, right? V of t is equal to lambda by dt or L di by dt. In other words, L, L di dt, which has always been what you guys have considered to be, um, uh, what? You guys have considered that to be um, what a voltage is on an inductor. It's this got to be the same as the rate of change of flux linkage. All right. What I'd like to do is relate that to what the magnetic field is inside this device. Okay. So how can I relate that to the magnetic field? Well, lambda is the flux linkage. All right. Well, that's what I'm going to get to. Right. What I'm going to get to is, is it's going to tell me about how the material itself behaves. Because saturation is going to impact how this guy behaves. All right. So, all right. Flux linkage. If I have n turns, how does that relate to flux? So if I had n turns of a coil wrapped around this thing, how does that relate to the flux in any one coil, which we call phi? Yep. N times the flux. How does flux relate to the B field? Flux density times the area. Flux density times the area. So we get this, you know, the NBA principle, right? So NBA equals lambda. So, <clears throat> all right. I want to make this guy here a phasor expression for a second. All right. I'll make this a phasor expression. I can write this as, and before I make it a phasor expression, let me write it this way. Let me plug lambda in here. All right. So I'll plug in my lambda into d lambda by dt. Before I do that, I got a derivative here. So N, B, and A, which one of those would be functions of time? Would it? Yeah, N and A should not be functions of time, right? I mean, the core shouldn't be getting bigger or smaller. The number of turns shouldn't be changing, unless I'm dropping it on the floor or something like that, but I mean, it shouldn't be changing, right? So basically, d lambda by dt should be what? Yep, so Na times dB by dt. All right. So I want to turn this expression here into a phasor expression. All right, so a phasor expression. So how did you turn, so D of t equal to L di by dt. As a phasor expression, just to make sure we understand, what when I say phasors, what the heck am I talking about? Magnitude and phase angle, and that only applies in what condition? What's the only condition where you can use phasers? What, what's the constraint for using phasers? Well, so what's that mean, AC domain? Use our RMS numbers. Well, we use RMS numbers when we do phasers here. I have to be in, I have to have a sinusoid and I have to be in steady state. All right. I have to have sinusoidal signals and I have to be in steady state. So V equals L di dt is true always, right? Like in transient conditions and all that kind of stuff. But if I go to steady state and I have sine waves, then I can use the phasor expression. So V equals L di dt in sinusoidal steady state is V equal to J omega L i. So without me trying to derive all this, what happens there? The di by dt, when I go to the phasor domain, what hap What does the d by dt do when I go from time domain to phasor domain? And you know this in the context of Fourier transforms, whether you remember it or not. If I take the derivative of a signal, what, multiply by j omega. Basically, as I go into the frequency domain, effectively what I'm doing is taking Fourier transforms, right? And so if I go and I look at n a times db by dt, what would that be in the phasor domain? Yep, so I'd have a J omega um, 
J omega A times N times B. All right, now this is going to matter for me here in a second. So uh, V equals, if I look at that, V equals J omega N A times B. So I drew two waveforms here. Ideally, I should be able to figure out which one is which. So let's say, let's just say I tell you the voltage is here. Wait, why do you underline this? It's a, it's a phaser. Anytime, anytime I'm talking about a phaser, I underline it. All right, so the voltage is here. This would be V of T, right? So I put a cosine. That's our definition of what we start with, right? So this is B of T, or at least what B of T should be. Now, what, which direction is the phase shift? Is that a positive? First of all, how many degrees phase shift? Let me ask you that. How many degrees of phase shift is there between V and V? 90. How can you tell it's 90? Maybe you know from looking at the map, but how could you tell, looking at those two pictures, that they're 90 degrees apart? One sine and one's cosine, they're 90 degrees apart. In other words, when this guy is going through zero, he's going through two, right? And vice versa. That's a 90 degree shift. Now, is that a negative 90 or a positive 90? It's negative 90. From V to B, it would be negative 90, because I, I, I would have to move V this direction. So I should see that here from this expression, right? If I did that in terms of, so I have a phaser equals J omega A and B. How would I write the angle of that? I'd say the angle of the voltage equals what? The angle of B plus 90. Where'd the plus 90 come from? Well, all right, yeah, you're looking at that picture. If I look at that expression, right, what's the angle of J omega A times N? So if I think of this as two complex numbers, right, one complex number is J omega A N and the other one is B. What's the angle of J omega A N? 90. Why is it 90? Yeah, so basically that, that vector is zero plus J times something, right? So J points straight up. It's got an angle of 90 degrees. So it's got a 90 degree shift. So in other words, I take if I take the B field, added 90 degrees to it, that would take B and shift it back that way, right? That's why it looks the way it does. Now, in theory, that's, what that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Now, in reality, what this material has is the material actually has a BH curve that looks like what we showed the other day, right? So I made the approximation that this thing was entirely linear. So I said H versus B look like that, All right? So what I said is I, I basically get a situation where the as the H field increases, in other words, the current increases, that makes an H field, as I relate that to the B field, things are linear for a little while and then it saturates. The reality is, is actually for a lot of materials, it curves, all right? Now the approximation I did the other day is good for a lot of devices like power electronics. Like the example I gave you in your homework, problem five, that's a power electronic thing. If I'm talking about something that's hooked up to the grid, it's gonna be made of iron. Iron has a BH curve that looks a lot more like that. All right. So what I'm going to see is if I apply a voltage to this thing. So if I have a voltage, that voltage, like we just said, is J omega L. Well, I can say that it's J omega times lambda. Right. The way way I got that was I basically just said that I I have V equals D lambda by dt, I can write that expression as a phasor expression. So that basically says that the, the flux inside this device would look something like this. I can relate that flux to the B field using everything I just wrote, J omega B, I'm sorry, J omega N A times B. What this says, is that the voltage, if I apply a 60 hertz voltage to this thing that's 120 volts or whatever, I'm going to get a sinusoidal B field, which looks like this. So I call this a flux wave, right? So I get a sinusoidal B field. So what I do is, is I re relate that 
through this curve, I say, okay, well, if my B field looks like a sine wave, so I, and I said the relationship between B and H actually has the what's shown here. This is what H of T would look like down here. In other words, it would look funny. You would think it, it, we have B equals mu times H. We say that's a linear relationship because there's just a scaling factor between B and H. But what I'm actually showing here is there's not, it's not a linear relationship, right? What it says is the relationship changes depending on what the B field actually is. So if I look at that current, that's what the current would look like versus time. This waveform right here, well, well, how would you describe this current? This is a sine wave. The B field is a sine wave. This is what the H field would look like. How would you describe this waveform here? Because the way I got this is I basically, you know, if I take the B field and I just trace the B field out over time. So like at this time, I look at where I am on this curve. And then I say, okay, well, on the, if I'm here on the Y axis, that means I'm here on the X axis. And I said, okay, that's what I'll get at that point in time. So basically you, you just, you can sketch this out. So, that's a sine wave. What's this? Well, I mean, so yeah, if I looked at this versus time, if I consider this time axis, this guy is going to be periodic, right? In other words, if I look at this, wherever this guy, wherever the B field's at his peak, he's at his peak. What would I see with this thing? How would you describe that waveform? You describe this guy as a sine wave. How would you describe this one? And it's funky for you to look at it that way. Let me look at it this way, all right? What I see here is, all right, so basically I said I can relate, I can relate the voltage to the flux. I can relate the H field to the current. So what I showed here is, here's the voltage that I apply. Here's the B field that creates. This is the current that's drawn. All right, so I put all of those on the same set of time axes right here. How would you describe, so V and B are sine waves, correct? How would you describe I? Yeah, it looks like a pulse, sort of, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, so it's a, it's a pulsatile waveform, all right? If I was Yahoo and I wanted to be a Mr. Math, right, how would I describe that as, as in math terms well very, i could probably describe it as a pulse train and so yeah i could start to approximate it as a pulse train of some kind even more general than that that's a fourier series is it not what's a fourier series how much of each frequency is inside of something how much of each frequency is inside of something? that's kind of that's directionally correct yeah i would say yeah uh you got the right idea what is it what is a fourier series it's a thing where you solve for some coefficients that have e to the j omega, but right? That's what a Fourier series is, right? <clears throat> what is a Fourier series? What does it mean to have a Fourier series? Fourier series exists for what type of functions? <laughs> These are all the words, yeah. No. So I can call a system LTI for sure. Um, and the, and systems have functions, they're system functions. Yeah, you guys know all the words, but it's hard to put them all together, right? It's hard to synthesize it. If I have a periodic waveform, a periodic waveform is a Fourier series, which means that it can be represented as what? A um... So don't don't do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're right. You you are. What he's about to say is correct, right? But it basically is that I can represent it. Tell me what that. Tell me what you were about to say, but in words, in human terms. A sum of sine waves. Sum of sine waves, right? <laughs> basically, what it says is that that current can be represented as a sum of sine waves. It's multiple different sine waves, and I could figure out the coefficients to figure out how much of each of those sine waves are there. All right. This is what I would call a nonlinear system because basically what's happening is I'm putting in a sine wave with one frequency, but I'm getting 
infinitely many sine waves out in forms of the current, right? So that's a nonlinear system. <clears throat> um, so what this means ultimately is I get all these harmonics that are flowing in the power grid as a result of this type of thing. I'm not gonna get into all those behaviors, but what it means is if I have a transformer and I put a voltage on it, I'm gonna get a current that's very badly distorted is the term that I use. So distorted meaning that it is, um, it doesn't look like what I put in. You're used to circuits, like everything you've done in circuits analysis, you put a sinusoidal voltage, you're gonna get a sinusoidal current, right? In this case, I'm putting a sinusoidal voltage and I'm getting a weird looking current out of it, a distorted current, many, many frequencies. The assumption going to phaser analysis was if I put one frequency in, all the currents and voltages in the circuit have the same frequency. In this case, all the currents and voltages have the same fundamental frequency, but there actually would be harmonics. So what are the what's a what would be a harmonic frequency? A multiple, of the a multiple of the fundamental. Yeah. So if I have 60 hertz, I'm gonna have 60, 120, 180, all, all so on and so forth. And you can sit down and do your Yahoo equations and, and determine that this guy will specifically have odd harmonics. All right. So we don't need to get into the details of all of that. Um, but basically what, what it matters is I get something that looks like what I have right there. And the reason it looks the way it does is because of this saturation behavior. All right. So there's that effect, right? There's another effect that sort of happens in these devices, which I didn't mention the other day. I kind of alluded to it, but basically the fact that cores have losses. All right. So in other words, what I have right here is an inductor that's wrapped around um, a core. And in particular, in this case, what I'm looking at is a core that has sheets. So if you look at this, the, this core that I have right here, um, I brought in one like this on Monday this week, which had basically sheets of iron. So what you see here, and I'll, I'll bring it in maybe, well, I won't be able to do it Monday, but I'll, maybe what I'll do is, um, I'll definitely bring it in next week. But you see, if you see sheets of the that are in that core, basically those are sheets of iron, all right? And they are called laminations. And there's reasons why we do this, right? So inside of a real core, there's at least three reasons why there are what we call quote unquote core loss. All right, and I included two of them here because these are the most important ones. Um, one of them here is called hysteresis loss, right? So I said something, what caused saturation? What caused saturation is like all these dipoles inside this device that basically move around, right? They move with the B field. Well, if I've got stuff moving inside of that core, what's gonna happen? If I have motion, <clears throat> What's happening? There has to be energy going into that motion, right? So what's that mean? There's kinetic energy that's basically got to be transferred from the coil that I, I'm basically applying a current to. There's energy being transferred from that coil to the motion of those materials. So there's energy in that, okay? Um, that's going to generate heat, okay? So if you touch a core, you touch a, if you touch an inductor that's doing something, if you touch it, it's going to be hot, all right? And, and you'll see that. If you go into an electrical room, for instance, in this building or any building, and you touch the transformers, right, they would be warm because what's happening is one of the things is all of these domains are basically moving around inside of that. thing. It's part of the reason why you hear it, all right? You'll actually hear the transformer a little bit because you're actually hearing the motion of these things inside of it. Now, the other thing that's going on is what's true about the magnetic material itself? What's true about iron? Well, iron's a magnetic material, right? And it's a metal. If I, if I take, what did Faraday's law tell us? What's Faraday's law say in words? Again, not, I mean, yeah, there's some math to it, but what's Faraday's law tell us? Faraday's... Mm -hmm. Amperes is the one that says, if I have a current going through, I'm going to get a field around, right? What's the other one that matters to us? Faraday's law. Is that a flux density one? They all have flux density in them somehow. At least Amperes law does too. <clears throat> Here's the deal, right? So 10 years from now, I'm going to see you somewhere 
uh, and I'm going to say to you, what's Ampere's law? And I expect you're not going to be able to tell me that it's like the integral of H dot dS, right? Ampere's law tells me if I have a current going through a surface, there's going to be a magnetic field that's generated around it, right? Faraday's law tells me what? Changing flux. If I have a if I have a coil, right, and I had a changing flux going through that coil, there'll be a voltage created. Well, it turns out if I just have a piece of metal sitting there and I try to pass a magnetic field through that metal, if that's a magnetic material, it's still going to be trying to create all kinds of currents and voltages inside of that material. We call that eddy currents. In other words, just the fact that I have a field going through that core means that it's going to actually induce currents in that coil. All right, just the fact that I have fields going through that iron is going to try to create currents in that iron. We call those eddy currents, all right? So part of the reason why we use these sheets, these what I call laminations, why that iron is broken up into sheets, is so that the pathways for that current are basically broken up. Right, so I can't, I can't have currents basically flowing all the way through this device, right? It kind of limits the way they can flow. We don't, that's a little bit beyond what you guys need to know, but basically um, what we get inside of these things is what we call hysteresis loss, eddy current losses, and I don't talk about the third one, which is everything else that can't be explained, right? That's, if, you, if you look at the theory of hysteresis and eddy current, there's a certain amount you should get, but it turns out there's a little bit more. So we have other losses, right? Which are, are more difficult to sort of explain. But, but the reality is that we, we use these things. Now, the other thing that we do um, is we add some material to change the conductivity. So, what, so you may have heard the term before. Sometimes we use what's called silicon steel. You may or may not have heard that term. But oftentimes these things are made of what's called silicon steel. So they actually take the steel and they dope it with silicon to reduce its... Uh, conductivity and basically reduce the impact of these currents. Bottom line to any of this stuff is here's what we find out, right? We find out that for different types of materials, we get different types of behaviors. So I talked the other day about saturation, right? Different materials have different saturation levels, meaning different peak B fields that they can carry. So the other day, the, and the example you have in the homework, right, is ferrite, the bottom one there, right, where I said the max B field you can have is somewhere between a quarter of a Tesla to about half a Tesla. For iron, which we're talking about like 60 hertz stuff, usually it's somewhere in the order of like 1.5 to 2 Tesla. All right, and then for some other applications, you might use what's called powdered core. So if you guys remember that, that um, toroid I brought in the other day, that's a powdered iron is what that is. The important thing here is that we talk about the core losses. This guy says low core loss. This guy has high core loss. The heck does that mean? Let's see if we can understand that a little bit better. Right? What we do, if I look at any material, I'll jump ahead and then come back. Basically, in this case, let's say I'm looking at a 60 hertz application. So what it shows here is a graph, and you're going to have something like this in the next homework, where what I'm looking at is... Um, for a typical type of steel, in this case, it's 29 gauge steel at 60 hertz. So <clears throat> what's the gauge of steel? Who knows what that is? The width. the width of it. Yeah, basically, if I took sheets of this thing, 29 gauge steel is a particular, is a particular width of steel. M19 talks about how it's, what its conductivity is. Okay? What I have here is a graph that shows me for a given B field, this value right here tells me a power density. So what it says is if my B field was, I don't know, somewhere around here, so 1.5 Weber's per meter squared, so in other words, 1.5 Tesla, okay, that the loss in that core would be, I don't know what this is, this would be about maybe about two watts per pound. Right? In other words, for a pound of that steel, I would be losing two watts inside of that thing. All right, is, is basically what that what that leads to. All right. And so how does that manifest itself in terms of if I'm an electrical engineer and I'm trying to think about what this thing means in the context of a real circuit? What does it mean? 
So from the perspective of a circuit, electrical circuit, looking into the coil that is wrapped around that iron, what's the electrical circuit model that you expect to have for this thing? So if I apply a voltage and a current flows, what would you see electrically? What would be the electrical model of this thing, do you think? What should it be? Well, I mean, just in general, if I told you I got, forget about everything we just said. If I said I just got coil wrapped around the core, what would you expect the circuit model for that thing to be? An inductor, right? right. I would expect it to be an inductor. Yeah, well, exactly, right. So in the in the elect and I and I could go, I could transfer, I make the magnetic circuit model and I can translate that to the L that I've got in the electrical circuit. So from an electrical perspective, I would expect to see this. What else should be there based on what I just said? If there's a certain power loss in this thing, what would that lead to? Well, if I have a power loss, how could I think of power losses? What causes a power loss? In an electrical circuit model, if I tell you I got an electrical circuit that's losing one watt of power and there's one amp going through it, there's a resistance somewhere, right? And we can work out that that resistance turns out to be in parallel. We could, we could talk about why that is, all right? <clears throat> why is that? Because the voltage... Without, I guess, getting getting too into the details of this, I guess I can say if I put a voltage on this thing, that leads to J omega N A times B. And it's the B field that I can relate to the power. So I can relate that to a resistance in parallel. I could rearrange that circuit and make it a resistance in series if I wanted to, right, in different ways. But what, I, what this leads to is what I wrote as RC, R core. Or is that resistance represents the fact that there is a loss inside this thing. So in other words, if, if I just have this thing as an inductor, what's an inductor supposed to do? Is an inductor supposed to have any loss? You guys learned that inductors were just storage elements. They're not lossy elements, right? They store energy. What this says is if I wanted to store energy in an inductor, there's no free lunch. There's some resistance because of all the things happening inside of that material. There's some heat loss. And so what we do is we model that as a resistor that is in parallel. Well, yeah, and that's what we're saying is in this case, this is one of the forms of loss is the fact that that material is not ideal, right? If that material were ideal, then I, I could I could do transfer of energy without some loss, right? But this is this is part of the reason why, right? So we're trying to get to the details of why that would be the case. So, all right, I have all that. Um, this term right here, we're going to start using a new term when I talk about this. And we're going to start using this. I'm going to use it here because we often use it in terms of transformers. I'm going to, say that, I'm going to call that a magnetizing inductance. All right. In other words, the, uh, it was, that's not all that important for today. But as I get the transformers, that, will, that name will matter. I'll call that the magnetizing inductance of the inductor. Why am I going to call it that? Because once I start talking about transformers, we're going to talk about another form of inductance, which is to say that some of the flux leaks out of the device. And that's going to give rise to what I call leakage inductance. For now, let's just call it that. All right. And let's look at an example. <clears throat> 